Today we have uh, eminent sculptor Rajinder Tikku with us. Uh, he has been invited by the Chandigarh Lalit Kala Academy to conduct a 10 day workshop with sculptors and uh, these are young sculptors and Mr. Tikku is helping them uh, in many ways to understand materials, thought, what goes inside a sculpture and is also uh, part of the entire workshop. We will talk to uh, Rindarji about uh, what sculpture means to him and also his uh, journey in the field of art. Welcome uh, to Chandigarh Lalit Kala Academy. And uh, you are here for a workshop on uh, sculpture. Yes, yes. Chandigarh so uh, Lalit Kala Academy has been kind enough to invite me. In fact, uh, this uh, uh, talk about this workshop was going on for a long time but somehow I could not make it. So now it has happened and I am here for last some days and I am supposed to stay for a few more days working with these young people and doing my own work You are doing your own work yes. also. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what is the workshop designed like if you could talk a little uh, about basically, it? Basically uh, uh, I have been, uh, I mean I have been known to as a sculptor who works uh, in, in, in terms of combination of materials uh, in sculpture, generally we, we take up a material for example, we do stone or metal or wood, but uh, for a long time I have been combining various materials, for example, terracotta and wood, stone and wood okay. and then now metal and certain other things. So. Okay. So it's a kind of uh, you know identification I have been I, I have attained. Uh, that's how Chandigarh Lalit Kala Academy also wanted me to mm, you know conduct a workshop in similar kind of direction where we are uh, working towards combination of wood mm -hmm. and metal. And so okay. we'll be uh, all of us will be doing something in wood carving or somewhere and part of it in metal casting then we'll combine okay the two the two okay. and um, try to produce a work each okay yeah. okay but uh, is there a specific subject or theme or no you have left no, it open no for there uh, is there is no no particular subject in fact uh, the young sculptors who are working with me are uh, in a way they are already into the field mm. so of course they are very young but they are already doing work and they have already over a period of years they have already evolved their own idioms. Okay. So they are working in the same direction but okay. of course with a little difference in material this time. Right, yes, right. Yes. And you are of course guiding them in whatever. Uh, not not straight way guiding <laughs> but of course talking to them and okay. uh, sharing with sharing them. Sharing with them. With them. And I feel I feel at a number of times I am getting guided by them. Okay. So it has been in fact as a teacher of sculpture also it has been my you know uh, my kind of behavior to learn from okay. young people okay. and that way we are you know we talk once a while twice uh, maybe in a day and i give them my suggestions that if 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 this thing would be tried like this so mm. what would happen so that is the it's it's not a kind of guidance but it's a kind of interaction interaction yes. okay so as a teacher of sculpture as exactly. well as a sculptor yourself, uh, how has the art form changed over the years in terms of um, uh, identifying with the world around us or identifying with um, foreign influences yes. or do we have uh, an intrinsic Indian element to sculpting? What, how, what do you see in uh, this world as a teacher as well yes. as a practitioner? It has, it has drastically changed. <coughs> and. Uh, certain changes have been wonderfully good and certain have not been. Uh, uh, you know, it's very important when, when we talk uh, something like global, uh, we, we gain a lot of things but we are, we are definitely losing okay. a number of things. Uh, for example, you know, a, a very strong identity okay. uh, for which a nation is known. Mm -hmm. you know uh, the, the the art forms various art forms or forms in literature uh, for these a nation is known and they they rather you know define the character of a nation okay. but uh, in terms of global we are we are uh, dissipating that and it is we lose that 
Uh, but at the same time, we gain a number of things. Uh, with, uh, the exposure becomes big, and we are, uh, you know, we rather get exposed to mm, different kind of uh, visual uh, language mm -hmm. uh, altogether. Uh, visual language, which is mo more more universal and more applicable everywhere. Right. So that's again, and. Uh, mm, the uh, another gain is uh, you know in terms of for example in terms of material and in terms of experimentation so those are the uh, gains uh, but at the same time uh, uh, we had for example uh, you know after our independence we had a very strong um, feeling about the about our own characteristics in in terms of visual arts uh, for which uh, Revival, revival school like uh, in Shantani Ketan in, in guidance of I mean uh, Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, people really tried to try to establish because we had been for a long time we had been ruled by the British yes. and they had established their uh, their um, own academic system mm -hmm. in our country and uh, sometimes we followed them so blindly. Then this revivalist school, they had tried to establish a, a very particular uh, national kind of identity it, in which they, they succeeded okay. to a greater extent. And we kept on doing like that for a long time. But as this, uh, you know, communication uh, with along with the communication uh, boom and globalization as we say that world has become a global village uh, all that thing has you know rather uh, diluted okay and as such uh, you know uh, oh, these days we we find an indian sculptor doing something like a scul sculptor doing somewhere in new york or right. somewhere in tokyo right so it has become all all the more similar so as such, it's a it's a greater challenge. Also, mm. you have to you have to rather mm, you know uh, face this challenge, which is which is more broader okay. in its perspective okay. as compared to what we had. Okay. Uh, uh, but my uh, my personal you know personal feeling always ha has been that uh, as a sculptor or as any mm. artist. Um, even literature or whatever, uh, it's it's very. I I feel very strongly. That it's very very important for us to imbibe from our tradition, okay. and then you know try to uh, transcend that and evolve a new kind of idiom, okay. because that gives us a rooting which uh, which makes our journey much, uh, you know, which makes our effort much serious and. Mm -hmm. the result more uh, more interesting and more uh, benefiting mm -hmm. uh, for us so that's why i have been over a number of years uh, you know rather uh, thinking in the direction of uh, mm, tradition and contemporaneity how how we can you know pass on pass over from tradition how we can imbibe tradition then keep it on and then pass on to something which becomes contemporary. Uh, so these are these are rather uh, academic and professional challenges mm. at the same right. time, and uh, I think everybody tries to solve them um, in 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 one's own individual capacity, and that's what I also have been doing over the years. Mm. But sometimes I feel that I am not in position to <laughs> solve <laughs> anything, so I keep on working whatever I like to okay. do. Okay. But sculpture as an art form uh, has a distinct place in the Indian art scene, you feel? Or is it still uh, the second or the third as compared to painting? No, sculpture, sculpture, unfortunately, <laughs> I mean, um, there is no doubt that we uh, very fine kind of sculpture happens in India, number one. And number two, there are wonderful possibilities of doing uh, very good work okay. uh, so far as sculpture is concerned in India because you know there are certain strategic uh, mm, 
uh, you know matters which get involved with sculpture. For example, uh, you get manual support easily okay. in India. Right. Uh, you have got these, you know, you have got very strong traditions which can be, uh, you know, pulled in and okay. applied. Right. Uh, uh, you have got some of the most wonderful craft traditions. Right. Uh, and if if all those could be, you know, uh, asso uh, associated mm. with um, with the work of any sculptors, we could find. Uh, better results mm -hmm. so there is great possibility mm -hmm. but so far as the uh, so far as the formal language of sculpture is concerned um, i don't think that we have uh, you know we have ever tried to evolve uh, formal lang formal language for the contemporary kind of contemporary idiom of sculpture we have ever tried to evolve a formal language or we have ever tried to understand what is what are the implications of a formal language and how should how we should approach the execution and appreciation of sculpture as an art form in scientific terms okay uh, because i strongly believe that art is to be executed and appreciated scientifically there has to be a scientific method okay. which uh, i mean which we which we appreciate in Western art, okay. but which we are never ready to apply in okay. our work. Okay. Okay. Uh, that is, uh, it's a kind of irony okay. which uh, which I feel that we should overcome, okay. and we should evolve, a, you know, methodology. I mean, it is there already, mm. but we have to be ready to adopt that methodology right. and apply, apply that and get better results. Okay. Yes. Okay. And does this uh, come from the fact that you were a very good science student and then a law student? So does this um, this background also make you think? Uh Possibly yes. Possibly yes. Because I I again believe that, uh, for for example, for a sculpture, I believe uh, you know understanding of dynamics is very important. Right. Because uh, it makes us uh, it 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 makes it easier for us to understand the the uh, the movement which a shape generates and how it generates and what are the possibilities. So, it is a scientific approach, but then basically um, uh, if I am not mistaken, I should, I should you know say that it is, it is the dynamics of form which makes our traditional sculpture so strong and mm. so eternal. Okay. For example, take the example of Nataraja. Yes is such an eternal form uh, in sculpture which is appreciated everywhere which has been appreciated o through all the times by everybody in all the s spaces and it is a pure demonstration of dynamics okay. Okay. of of a figure you are right mm. uh, which which transforms into nataraja which transforms of course we have got other other associations also with it but uh, yes. Keeping those associations uh, aside, if we look at it as a shape, it's a dynamic. I uh, see how uh, how Nataraja is appreciated by um, by an art critic from the West. Yes. How Nataraja is uh, you know mm, shown as an example in uh, you know mm, very very f uh, you know very common TV serials yes. like TV programs yes. like. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, you know programs related with aliens and <laughs> something you know so uh, it is only the dynamics of the shape right which makes it so strong and which makes it i should say again eternal in effect which is very very important for any any strong work of sculpture whether it it is uh, it has been done very early or it is being done now so that scientific approach helps us mm -hmm. to do that mm -hmm. Uh, and the scientific approach helps us to appreciate also. Okay. Um, if you if you go for the you know st uh, study of criticism of art, art criticism or appreciation, mm. I think the best language is scientific. Mm. Uh, the, it ha the best terminology is scientific terminology, right. Right. which makes us to you know get through. Okay. 
into okay. uh, aesthetics is okay, but terminology is uh, a, a scientific term terminology which helps us to understand or which helps us to you know go theoretically okay. uh, into the areas of appreciation also. So that way, uh, I I believe that yes, we must have a scientific approach. Mm. And as you asked, yes, because I was a science student and I studied physics and chemistry. Uh, so, these uh, studies have always helped me. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It, it's very simple. For example, if uh, as a sculptor, if you go in for ceramics, you have to, you have to know the chem it's all chemistry. Yes. It's all chemistry. The chemical composition. Yes, it's all chemistry. Reactions. It's all chemistry. And, you know, when you do bronze, it's all chemistry. Okay. It's okay. metallurgy and mm -hmm. uh, chemistry so far as the, you know, the process is concerned. But, right. But, uh, uh, patina, it's all chemistry. If, if you've got an understanding of chemistry, you can you can generate better patina, better surface treatments. So that's very, very important okay. Okay. to me, but possibly. Yes. yes. But you talked of um, Nataraja as uh, a figurative form which is eternal, but you as a sculptor don't do uh, figurative work in your sculptures. No, never. I have, in fact, in fact, uh, if you know while working i i i feel that something uh, something figurative has appeared i try to demolish <laughs> it as, as early as possible in Why my work is that? that's because you know because uh, uh, i would uh, i would always like to generate forms which which could not be associated directly with the reference outside. Okay. So, as, as such, the figure becomes a very strong reference. Right. And uh, in some ways, uh, when you look at uh, such works, sometimes it, it seems that we are not appreciating the sculpture, we are, we are appreciating the figure. Okay. Okay. It happens in terms of material also sometimes. Right. You know, for example, you use some kind, some best wood. Right to do a sculpture and then you know the appreciation comes for the wood, for the wood. Okay. Uh, okay. and not for the form. Right. Uh, I mean it's my personal experience so I had to change from very good kind of wood <laughs> earlier times to very bad kind of wood. But so mm. so okay. as not to allow the appreciation of wood yes. only. Mm. So uh, uh, that is how it has been. Um, happening with me also and uh, so I have I have always been uh, so far as sculpture is concerned I have always been trying to you know uh, create shapes and arrive at um, at a shape which is autonomous which becomes autonomous in its character and uh, uh, gains its own reality right. which I which I strongly believe that should be the um, you know characteristic of a sculpture it, it has to you know um, again its own uh, reality which comes through a process and then it has to be autonomous. Okay. Uh, it has to be autonomous as a shape which can be which can be deciphered, which can be you know looked into, understood or uh, theorized or conceptualized, but uh, through a process of understanding, through a process of understanding of dynamics, through a process of understanding of the material behavior, right. you are one, I mean, as an as a individual sculptor, I have always been trying to arrive at such a kind of shape which becomes autonomous. Okay. So, that is how I avoid figure, right. because that is one of the first steps towards, you know, trying to impart autonomy to a shape. Okay. If you if you do something which is recognizable, mm -hmm. or if you do something for which you have got an immediate reference, then uh, then comparisons you know take over. Okay. okay. And uh, within that jumble of comparisons, you may you, you you your shape may just get diluted. Okay. So that's how I have been doing. Okay. Yes. But when it comes to, you draw a lot, you mentioned, yes, yes. and uh, once, and uh, you work a lot on paper. Yes, yes. So, do figures um, find a place in your whenever I do, Whenever I work on paper, I do absolutely figurative. <laughs> I do absolutely figurative. And it is, uh, you know, almost, 
almost illustrative sometimes. Of course, uh, uh, again, uh, not illustrative of something, you know, okay. something known already. Right. It's illustrative of my own, you know, I, um, as a matter of my own characteristics, I, I generally, you know, I work like a child. Okay. Um, I go on, you know, uh, generating my own stories and narrating them to my own self silently okay. and so uh, and whenever I work on paper I try to you know illustrate those stories okay. Okay. Uh, and that uh, the, the uh, final expression comes in terms of figurative uh, drawings or whatever you call them. Uh, plus, uh, there is a there is an inherent inherent difference between sculpture and painting because mm. sculpture, since it's a three dimensional right. uh, form of art, so there is all possibility of as I was telling you earlier, there is there there is this great possibility of imparting uh, autonomy to it. That's right. As you impart, uh, I am not saying something big. As you impart an autonomy to a chair. Yes. It at one time it becomes an object on which you can sit, sit which yes. you can use yes. uh, in the same way. And it is a three dimensional mm. object, it, mm. it occupies some space and it has got uh, you know, form it has got a shape. form and it has got a function. Absolutely. So, that is possible with three dimensional. Uh, in, in, in two dimensional works like drawing and painting, it is only illusion of that. Right. So, in order to establish certain things, I, I made works which are referral, you know, right. which, 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 uh, which have got a kind of reference, mm. though a reference which is again not outside, which is in my, in, in my mind or which is in my thoughts or which is in my, you know, kind of feeling or mm. emotion. So, the figures at that time become only, you know, a kind of uh, carriers of that emotion okay. and I find them very active carriers of, okay. very active and very suitable carriers of that emotion. So, I, I use figurative elements in mm. my work mm. uh, and uh, uh, when I, when I travel, when I go to m uh, places, you know, although I do not do on the spot sketching, sometimes I do it on the spot and uh, but you know, when you go to a place, you remember many things. If you if you if you interact with a place right. silently, you you remember a number of things. And then, uh, sitting back home silently, I try to you know, kind of write that diary, okay. but in in terms of visuals. Okay. In terms of, for example, I had been to Egypt, and you know. Uh, anybody should say that Egypt is a kind of pilgrimage for any artist. So, I came across a number of things. I talked to people, we went through villages, we went through Nile and of course through, of course to all the, you know, well-known monuments of Egypt. It was, it was such an elating experience and on coming back, I did a whole series of works which were based and I did a lot of uh, work on papyrus which I had bought from there okay. so in order okay. to you know retain a character of right so there I found that you know incorporating figurative elements is very very important because they help you in narrating the story, story. they mm -hmm. help you in re in rather reviving the story mm -hmm. which you have already mm -hmm. you know experienced Interesting. so that way mm, there is always this difference between uh, okay. uh, my work in sculpture and my work okay. is exactly opposite. Opposite, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You talked about stories, that is always a story inside you yes. which gets translated yes. onto paper and sometimes. Yes. But does it also get translated into your sculptures? Yes, definitely, definitely. Mm. I do, I, I work like that only and uh, I would like to mention it here that uh, I have been born and brought up in a village. And for a long, long time, I had to live with my mother, and only we two would be. We had a, a big family, but my elder, elder brothers and sisters, they had, they would go for studies into the town. My father would be somewhere else, also. so my mother and myself uh, would be together. And uh, the the ambience in villages, and especially in Kashmir, is. It's very story-like. Okay. In itself, it's very story-like. Okay. So, I mean, um, 
it is uh, it's very silent and a very philosophic and mm -hmm. very you know mm, uh, the amb ambience is very very dominating so we have longer winters yes and when you have longer winters you have got longer nights yes and it was there was a tradition of uh, you know listening to stories right. from elders which i remember very sharply which has vanished now and there was a tradition of uh, dastan goi uh, we would have mm, night long even i mean not night long but maybe three nights four nights wow it would stop in the day okay and rebegin in again. the night okay. uh, it's called as dastan dastan is a story yes so i uh, i don't say that i am direct i am directly you know as a, as a matter of uh, response to that kind of stimulus i have i am doing no but it's a it's a kind of thing which build up your temperament you know you, right. you you got uh, one gets interested in such kind of so that element of tale mm. element of story and mm. element of narration listening to it imbibing from it so all together that always seemed very interesting to me and uh, when i grew up and started working i didn't know about it i tell you honestly i didn't know about it but in retrospect when i have grown up much more now right. in age and maybe in work also when i saw it in retrospect then i find no this might be the uh, reason and it may start when i start doing the work or it may start midway right. or it, and then certain elements may get eliminated uh, you know and ultimately i reach a result and uh, you will be surprised that some of my titles are like stories okay for you instance know, uh, for example i i did uh, through my um, you know through my early exhibitions in delhi i would always do a series of uh, a set of sculptures for children okay and for example there were small uh, so small little five sculptures for example a, a sparrow a right. tortoise or okay. uh, um a dow okay. and the sun you know and uh, then the titles of these sculptures would run like a nursery rhyme <laughs> uh, the title of one sculpture would be the line of a nursery rhyme and then it would okay. be a nursery rhyme of five lines oh, okay mm, i still remember for example the sun and the black dog and the sun stood still for the whole day yes, uh, you know yes, uh, yes. Sto lines like mm, these mm. so that story element you know kept on occurring and reoccurring and i applied it and that's how many of these titles you know and that is perhaps the reason that not a single work of mine is untitled right whatever as many works as i have done up till now whether it's small little work or huge work it has got a title which uh, gives you the first passage into the work later on you may explore on your own so that is possibly that uh, you know the way i deal with the context that's right that's how the way i deal with the context and it comes up in in all the works and ultimately you find that there you right. find that there yes and uh, and some uh, at at certain places very clearly hmm. at certain places with an amount of ambiguity okay. which ambiguity i always like yes. ambiguity is a very strong element uh, in all forms of art especially poetry and visual arts uh, so uh, that's how it it you know it it comes into my work right because i have been i have been brought up with uh, the tradition such kind of tradition mm. yes mm. Uh, the rishi culture sufiana dastan goi right. storytelling and you know even even the you know recitation of uh, um maybe bhagavad gita certain times because nights would be so long mm. and we were very small kids mm. we would sit down and listen to some mm. uh elder person in the family especially uh, bhagavad gita shrimad bhagavat it's it's a 
it's only compila compilation of stories which yes. have got morals and yes. so that element in its own in a different way mm. that runs through mm. and that runs through as a as a as a kind of uh, uh, you know as a kind of mm, you know as a kind of life force okay. through through okay, that's my work. Yes, okay. yes. And and do the stories have a definite shape also or no sometimes sometimes just yes they have okay. yes they have they mm -hmm. have a definite shape and sometimes uh, just maybe just fluid, fluid kind of yes yes, yes 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 you talked about stimulus so in your work what is the stimulus is it the object is it the material is it the story or is it all of it when you talk about uh, i um, i again i should say that i, I have got a very very s clear and uh, strong feeling that it's um, all art happens uh, due to uh, you know the the stimulus and response uh, mechanism uh, whether we understand it at a particular time or we don't understand but of course there are certain stimuli and as a response to those stimuli we do certain things uh, now as I am a visual artist or there is a painter, the, the stimulus comes out in terms of a painting or in terms of a sculpture as it comes out in terms of a poem. With a, but there is, there is always uh, a stimulus. And uh, it's not true about me only. If you, if you go through, uh, you know, uh, uh, for example, development of art as a whole in okay. up till 20th century. So, okay. there, there is a whole set of stimuli right. uh, beginning from, uh, it's, it is written, it is, you know, recorded at many places, beginning from, uh, from, uh, the, the, from the invention of flying machine okay. or aircraft, beginning from the works of Wright brothers. Right through uh, Freud and Jung, the psychological mm. theories which, mm. which changed the whole character of the Western society as such, which demolished that dualism, uh, you know, human dualism. And then, you know, coming to world wars, World War One, World okay. War Second, and then the Industrial re Revolution. When That's we right. go through history of art, for okay. uh, especially in the West, because they have a wonderful study of their things. Yes. So when we go uh, through the study, they always assign a particular, uh, you know, particular period in visual arts okay. as a response to something which has happened in the in the in the right. history. Right, right, right. Uh, as we know, when we when we uh, go through the recent uh, history of recent past, yes. World War Second influenced a lot right. of. Yes. Uh, I mean, it influenced everything Every in the West. Everything, mm. whether it's literature or painting or films, films or sculpture, it, it influenced everything. So, this uh, system of uh, uh, stimulus and response is very, very fundamental right. to en to work of any artist. And again, if I, if I come back, this is what I call as the scientific study. <laughs> uh, no True. stimulus and response as as a study we we go through it in when we study physiology yes, you yes, know? yes. it's a, it's a system it's a it's a it's a phenomenon which is established uh, which is confirmed mm. uh, so so there is no harm if we study our work as uh, as a manifestation of this phenomenon True. of stimulus right. and response and it happens yes and we are suppo we are we are rather i feel we should f feel like you know understanding our work through you know okay. if this is the work what was my what was my stimulus basically why did i do like this okay. Okay. there must be some reason yes. there must be some reason yes. you know i tell you when i was a child we used to have these log houses in our um, uh, in addition to our, the house where we lived, lived we would have a log house okay. outside okay. which was generally used as a as a grain storage Ji. along with a place uh, for the guests okay. to come so so that they could stay just outside the main house and, and since it was made out of logs only so there were these knots and anytime it would rain there would be a 
a number of shapes which would you know okay. come up okay. in those logs those right. in fact those knots would get you know rather identified okay. when they would get wet and as a child i would like um, i would i would enjoy seeing shapes in those okay. seeing shapes of animals and seeing shapes in those of anything that's any okay. That's that I, 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 as a child I couldn't do any art because we didn't have arrangements of uh, study of art in our school. So then when I, you know, fell into it seriously, I thought in retrospect, so that might have been a stimulus mm -hmm. to me, right. which, which got stored there in mind. Yes, and oh, after a long time, I found ways and means to give vent to that or, or respond to yes, that stimulus. Yes. I don't know how 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 much I came close to success or not success, but there was already a stimulus. Yes. And response may come instantly or response may come later. Later. Mm. That's how it happens. So okay. it okay. is a it is a method. Right. I believe which needs to be one needs uh, one needs to look into one's own method personally. Mm. Yes. But but there are ways and means to see that. Yes. yes. So when did sculpture so happen? Uh, when did uh, you studied science and you studied law? So how did... Yeah, basically uh, I, um, uh, you know, I had, uh, I was interested in, you know, t um, studying drawing as a subject in the school, but uh, we didn't have the arrangements for the, that study and later on as I, as usual, I became a, a student of science and uh, Basically, my first love was to, mm, you know, join army. Okay. So, but, uh, and it will be interesting that I, I, I traveled from uh, Srinagar, Kashmir yeah. to Jammu for the first time in order to sit in an in, in, you know, Indian military <laughs> services examination, okay. uh, where uh, I failed in mathematics. Okay. Because the mathematics was, um, it was kind of very different from what we, we, were, we, we were studying in ordinary kind of schools. Yeah. It, was, it was kind of what we now what we call as modern mathematics yes. it, at that time. So I couldn't do that. And after that I studied in college and I studied, in, I studied science stream, all the four sciences, chemistry, biology and, and uh, but since I could not uh, get in the army, I didn't get frustrated as such, but uh, you know, I had to find some other engagements. And at that time, we had this arrangement of, uh, you know, uh, going to college in the morning session, right. 7 a.m. to 2, okay. and from 2 p.m. onwards going to, mm, we had an institute of fine arts in Srinagar, okay. so going to that. Okay. Uh, it was basically established by Jammu and Kashmir Cultural Academy uh, for encouraging people who were interested in, you know, uh, okay. in arts. So, as a matter of fact, it had started as a hobby okay. center, but by the time I reached there, it had evolved into something uh, more concrete than a hobby center. So, right. we had, and uh, a number of very brilliant young people at that time had come from Baroda, okay. JJ School of Art, okay. and from Delhi College of Art, right. even from Shantiniketan, who established these two institutions, one in Srinagar and one in Jammu, because you okay. know our state has got these two divisions, so we have yes. to have everything in two. In two. <laughs> yes. So, I somehow came to know that there is an institution which imparts, you know, kind of regular training in uh, fine arts. So, I, I went there and there was this possibility of, they did not ask me to discontinue with my, my study. Yes, so, okay. they said that, okay, if you have got the morning session, you can go there, but our uh, institution starts at 2 and it goes up till 8 p.m. Okay. It was very suitable arrangement for me. So, I right. would go to college in the morning and after the college was finished, I would straightway directly go to mm -hmm. and ultimately reach back home at 8 uh, p.m., okay. uh, leave the home at 7 a.m. So, that made it possible for me to continue my studies in okay. college and okay. take up these studies, which right. were very regular because these people had come from Baroda, say, so uh, these institutions, our institute was built. 
exactly on the uh, pedagogical pattern of Baroda. Okay. Everything was same, you okay. know, the syllabi, the courses of study, the methods of teaching, and okay. even books. And okay. I mean, Baroda was a Baroda was a, for us. It was a reference in absentia. We, yeah, uh, yeah. we felt that we are studying in, in Baroda Baruta. because these people would be. Baroda was on their head and soul yes. and heart, so they will be talking about yes. Baroda always. Yes. So we always felt that. So as such, um, I continued on with the college, and and by the time I completed my uh, college with science subjects, I felt interested in study of law, and okay. I joined the university, and again morning in the university, and. Okay. So by the time I had completed my uh, B.Sc. graduation in science and then graduation in law, LLB, I had completed these five years here. Also, okay. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, one thing interesting which I would like to tell here is that uh, when when I decided of going to the College of Fine Arts, Institute of Fine Arts, which it, uh, is even now called as. Mm, I had a fairly good uh, idea of what painting is, okay. is as a, because through newspapers or through magazines we would come to know about painting. painting. Okay. But uh, I didn't know much about the practice of sculpture. Okay. It was only at the institute that when I saw, for example, uh, the person who became my teacher later on, Gayur Hassan, uh, when I saw him working. Mm. I thought that okay, there is another uh, possibility of practice in visual arts, and as a okay. as a as a mm, you know adventurous young man, I found <laughs> that it's a difficult job, so I must do difficult <laughs> job. So there was nothing, no particular reason. So the energy of the youth. energy, yes, energy <laughs> of you know you would like to do something difficult. Yes. So I, as a as a specialization, I took to sculpture, and that's that. Then I continued on oh, yeah. and. Uh, for for even for getting better training in in areas of carving, especially stone carving, okay. I I then associated with uh, wayside um, carving workshops, which we have in abundance in Srinagar, and with a wonderful uh, these wonderful masters okay. uh, working there, who basically would uh, do stone carving for architectural purposes and okay. for decorative purposes okay. and for making tombstones as mm. we find in Kashmir, we find them in uh, calligraphy yes. on stones. Yes. So those are, those were, you know, very challenging technical things and if one learns those, one can do anything in stone. Okay. okay. Like if you can do geometry in stone, then you can do anything in stone. Okay. It's, it's technically correct. Right. Uh, right. I mean, what I am saying is technically correct. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, I spent a lot of time there, uh, okay. there okay. with them learning various techniques of stone carving okay. and understanding stone as a material okay. as such, you okay. know, understanding the defects in stone, understanding right. the possibilities, understanding the limitations okay. or, or even understanding the better kind of stone, okay. you know, okay. uh, or knowing it from the bad kind of stone. Mm -hmm. okay. So, that is how I carried on till, till I, you know, completed my studies and after completion of my studies, I was, uh, you know, given this teaching assignment okay. in the same institute but in Jammu. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, so on coming to Jammu, you know, uh, as I was mainly trained in, I mean, did a uh, lot of stone carving. In Jammu, we do not have stones mm. locally okay. available. Okay. And I would not like to sit idle in and wait for the stone to come. So I started, you know, uh, fiddling with other materials. Okay. That's mm. how clay came in. The, uh, that's how clay came oh, okay. in, and I, okay. you know, one of my another teachers who was basically in the painting department, yeah. but since he had come from an uh, from a kind of inclusive training mm -hmm. of technical institutions like uh, Delhi College of Art at that time, it, it included everything. Okay. Okay. And he had uh, studied at uh, Lucknow College of Art also. Okay. It was an inclusive college where you were supposed to study everything. So oh, okay. he was wonderfully good at doing work in clay and then firing it. Oh, okay. So looking at him, although he would do 
little work in clay, but looking at him, I thought that this is a possibility. So, if okay. I am not having my favorite material right now, let me okay. uh, take to clay. Okay. And as such, I started doing, you know, small little works in clay okay. and then uh, arranging to fire them okay. and bake them to turn them into terracotta. and. Uh, to be to be more closer to this medium than I <laughs> associated with the potter, local <laughs> potter, and uh, you know worked with him for two years. Okay. Okay. And uh, where I completed a lot of my works, which 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 ultimately became the body of work which I showed in my first exhibition in Delhi, which was highly appreciated by all the people, okay. you know. And later on, that continued. Okay. Okay. And, um, and then you shifted to, uh, you use a lot of different materials in your works. And yes, you combination of, of uh, uh, yes, I have always been interested in combining uh, and uh, mm, from terracotta and combining the terracotta and wood, I, I just, you know, did experiments in combining uh, stone and wood. Okay, okay. Uh, because I had go, I had this you know inherent feeling of this com and this combination would not come uh, as a matter of fancy. Okay. It would come uh, as a matter of uh, you know. It would have a reason mm. uh, behind mm. you know. Okay. Uh, uh, for example, I did a whole series which was called as uh, you know, Iris Inside. Iris is a flower yes. and I always believe that all of us have an iris inside and whenever it finds a crack, whenever it finds a through, through it blossoms out. Okay. It was a very simple kind of, um, because we have got a lot of irises uh, growing in Kashmir, Kashmir. and especially the, they grow on graveyards, uh -huh. wild irises. <laughs> so it was a kind of, you know, material manifestation of my idea that see the irises grow wherever they find a place mm. they grow and they make uh, I thought in the same way we have got all of us have got an iris inside and so to have a to have a crack mm. and to have something growing out of mm. it these materials would help me yes. you know the crack in the stone yes, and yes. the iris of wood yes. which I could paint and make into I said growing out of mm. it mm. then it got it got a, a number of other Okay. you know shapes and uh, okay. but uh, absolutely same interpretation mm. but number of other shapes okay. and uh, at uh, one time then it got automatically related to uh, you know the tough situation we had in Kashmir over the years which we are having even now, now. Uh, there was uh, uh, for example mm, uh, one work which was called as uh, the illustration for the hanging of an iris, okay. you know, when we started having these unfortunate incidents of killings and hangings. So, uh, I expressed it in, and so there again these combination of materials okay. helped okay. me. Okay. So, and uh, using wood, it, it would rather, you know, help me in terms of a material which, which uh, accepts color as such. Right. No, no other material accepts color or dyeing or staining okay, okay, okay. as wood accepts. So, uh, that is uh, that is one of the reasons I, you know, I combine where I, where I needed to stain or to dye, mm. I would choose a kind of wood because it would traditionally takes color, color okay, properly. Okay. Then combine it mm. with other material which would stand for oppression, for right. example, uh, oppression weight of a situation, right. for example, stone, you know, right, toughness right. of a situation. Gee. So, that is how the reasons for combination of these mm. materials okay. came, you know, in the same way terracotta and wood where, you know, uh, where you form combinations, where you, where you, uh, rather, you know, where you express your feelings of being together, mm. being close together. Mm. So, this wood pressed into okay. clay and okay. then clay fired then wood again set. Mm. So, this would you know give me a chance to uh, do that kind of exercise. Okay. So, 
that's how I worked in these uh, different ways. And this is what elicited that your theory of materialization of thought. Was yes, but yes, uh, because I, I, you know, if you if you just tell me to sum up uh, my way of uh, my sculpture or my way of doing it, uh, it will be it. It is summed up in just this sentence only: is materialization of thought. Mm. Uh, you know, thought is. Uh, yeah, it's expressed in a number of yes. ways. Yes. You know, it may be expressed in writing, it may yes. be expressed uh, even in music, yes. dance, whatever. And here we 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 transform thought into a into a solid material. Right. right. So it's uh, that's how I I look at my work. There is a kind of thought mm. which may be which may be. Mm, very recent or which may be right in front of you or which may have been you know coming to you from your ancestry yes. or which may be coming to you from somewhere else in the world right correct right. of course you know we are exposed to thoughts from all over the world that's right and uh, you respond to certain thoughts more uh, more uh, you know more actively as compared to other thoughts that's right Certain thoughts, uh, you know, rather they 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 justify your own aspirations also. So uh, then, you know, exp uh, then uh, transforming that thought mm. into uh, into sculpture, gotcha. or rather uh, trying to interpret that thought in terms of solid material, okay. which you give a shape or mm. which you give some kind mm. of structure. Right. So that is that is the fundamental phenomenon. Right. That's the fundamental, and I I believe that it is so with all the sculpture. That's right. If it is not so, mm, mm. I I believe that there is something wrong. Right. There is right. something wrong. It cannot be. You know, sculpture cannot be uh, what you do with your two hands up till here only. Yes. So it has to come from here <laughs> to here, to here also, yes. and even. Uh, sculpture has to work with your body dynamics also, yes, yes. with your with your own physicality, with mm. your own you know structure. Mm. So, unless and until there is this totality, I find there there may be some some defect somewhere. Okay. Either it may be in us as sculptors, or yeah. it may be in our world. <laughs> yes. So, where does Kashmir figure? Uh, in your works, be it its beauty, be it its violence, be it its unrest, I'm sure inside you there's always. Yes, uh, I am. I, 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 you know, I say it aloud that I am a hardcore Kashmiri. <laughs> you know, and uh, whatever, uh, whatever I have been doing, has happened uh, because of my being a Kashmiri, basically. Yes. And then also because of shifting from Kashmir to Jammu. Yes. Uh, because of my being a Kashmiri was you know in uh, uh, which which uh, allowed me to have a kind a particular kind of training which didn 't come as a, as a regiment uh, regimented training as such but which came as a as a you know life procedure right. uh, we had this uh, culture of rishis and Later on, which became Sufi culture, I, it was rather ingrained in the day-to-day -day practice in okay. Kashmir. Not, not in my case only. It was Everyone? just, uh, okay. it was just ingrained in the whole social okay. structure. Okay. Uh, we would be, I mean, people would talk about harmony. People would talk about peace. People would talk about all good things in uh, life. Or people would talk about, you know not letting life as such to fall apart yes. trying uh, you know methods to keep it together uh you know darvesh you know as you find those yes. sutures yes. in the yes. those are used in sculpture also okay. uh, so that was the kind of uh, uh, training and uh, that automatically automatically it appeared uh, in my work, and then later on, when I shifted to Jammu, uh, there was this uh, very interesting exposure to a very what I what I later on called as 
a very express culture you mm. know there are it's very strong visual culture uh, mm. jammu right although we are the parts of same state but kashmir is entirely different okay. when you when you go to kashmir you feel that you are in a different country okay not at in a different place but right. you are in a different country but uh, so i i have concluded that mm, the kashmir culture i call it as implied culture mm. which cannot be seen directly <laughs> which can be seen when you are when you are a kashmiri or when you get into it right it is so silent and so subtle uh well as when you come to this side of peer panchal when mm. you come to this side of mount is very express everything is very visible and dynamically visible right. so i i i got interested in uh what we call as wayside shrines yes and uh, you know small little things which are basically it was getting interested in a phenomenon of uh, evolution of sacred okay for example you know some people come they put a stone then they put another stone then some some day they put were million on it mm. some day they they tie mm. threads on it apart from its uh, religious connotations i found it uh, it a continuously as a continuously happening phenomenon right of generating something sacred and over a period of time this place would become sacred yes. and you know yes. and so this uh, continuous generation of sacred interested me okay and i tried to uh, you know mm, perform experiments okay. in this direction in terms of my sculpture theek okay. so as such you know my sculpture got this element of sacred incorporated okay so a number of shapes which i did earlier were were, were termed as sacred okay and silent also yes because uh, these these places these uh, this whole phenomenon would uh, you know exude a kind of uh feeling of silent and sacred which which i try to incorporate in my work that okay. was my concern for for okay. a number of years okay even now in in many ways mm so that made me to go to number of places around jammu uh, to farther places in the mountain or uh, uh, which are a little far off where you know you had heard that you know, there is such kind of shrine okay. there is this you know okay. i i visited a number of naga temples okay. Okay. where i got lots of interesting shapes to look at right. which later on i applied okay of course i mean the shapes had not to be applied as they were no. seen okay so i would go and look at the things not take the pictures do not make the sketches so that you carry uh, a direct impression so i would go and see if i can imbibe from the whole environment and then i would come and try to recreate that in my own terms which on those days uh, i became quite successful in doing that okay and uh, so these these two element these two you know factors yes. basically they they uh, influenced my work a lot and uh, so far as my work in kashmir is concerned and is basically uh, you know the beginning uh, of my work because i was there as a student and i was there for for maybe one or two years after completing the academic studies but later on as i shifted to jammu and uh, uh, so far as the situation in the uh, you asked about the kashmir uh, situation so far as the situ- political and or rather socio political yes. situation in kashmir is concerned yes that that became a matter of concern and again uh, naturally yes not that i am a kashmiri and i should do something or okay. i should uh, you know is a yell, propaganda yeah yeah and yeah. cry yeah. and you know yeah. raise slogans no, no never like that but uh, uh, after this you know uh, what we call as exodus of a number of people um, hundreds and thousands of people in back in the, from winter of 89 till the summer of 91 mm-hmm. uh there were many things which happened around us uh, uh, which could uh, which which 
uh, had an influence not us as artists only, they had influence on everybody. Right. I do not specialize in saying that I am sensitive and yeah, yeah. so it influences me only. No. Mm. It first of all, uh, it had the influence on the people who went through that yes. uh, hell, yes. including my family, okay. uh, because I, it was only me out of my family who was in the rest mm -hmm. of the family was. was there. So it it had the effects on almost every single person uh, who left that place and who stayed behind. Mm. Um, yes. It's not true to say that only people who had to leave their homes had to suffer. No. The people who 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 stayed back, yes. they had to suffer more because they were within that fire yes. of whatever was happening. Right. Uh, this sex, this um, you know, set of people who migrated or who shifted from there, they had different problems. They also had lots of challenges. But those, the people who were left back, had you know, they had tremendous, uh, you know, they were living in fire, you know, fire. So, but. All this, uh, you know, one could not uh, remain uninfluenced by all this, which uh, what happened around. So, uh, it it occurred in a number of my works, uh, like sunrises on the camp, sunsets on the camp in memory of the lost cow, um, the eclipse, and many many other. And these all these works have gone to certain, you know. I mean, they are they are in collection of some uh, good places, uh, but of course, uh, um, I always tried uh, uh, to to raise this kind of slogan, uh, this feeling of homelessness, this feeling of you know, feeling of loss in total. I try to raise it to the level of art. <laughs> and not bring art down to the level of making it a slogan. So, right. my works uh, never became like posters, right. uh, like uh, like posters in three-dimensional posters, they never, yeah. they, they, they still remained like my uh -huh. works, but at the same time they would make a very strong socio-political statement. Right. Right. Uh, so, that automatically happened, then that automatic, automatically happened number of works, okay. the number of works and that automatically happens up till now, okay. especially in terms of, um, as you were mentioning earlier, especially what I do on paper, okay. that's all that. Okay. Uh, that's a kind of, as I told you earlier also, that's an illustration of this kind of feeling of loss, yes. this kind of feeling for identity, yes. this ki kind of, you know, in totality and identity crisis, which you always feel if you are if you do not have your foot on your own ground. own own mm -hmm. ground mm -hmm. so uh, that automatically appears and it has come up uh, in a number of my works in a number of my works and also your recent work which is on scans as yes uh, scans also i am now i am doing these works in bronze which are you know, for example you know a CT scan of skull and the diagnosed problem is, uh, you know, yearning for a home. Mm. Uh, because uh, now uh, the interesting part uh, of it is that, uh, for example, this um, work which I am talking about, it automatically, uh, it automatically dissociates from the particular problem. <laughs> A yearning for a home is a problem mm. with anybody, mm, mm, mm. so it automatically dis uh, possibly that is uh, when you when you I should not say when you get mature, but when you grow old, <laughs> you <laughs> automatically you know dissociate from certain things, and which means right. that uh, your particular things become universal. Right. So, uh, as I was talking about this yearning. Uh, mm, uh, yearning for a home, it is, it is a problem which any human being anywhere, any time faces and uh, any human being has got that feeling for home. But uh, of course, it, it, it grew up, it generated from this uh, previous problem and 
but it grew up to a different extent. Right. Uh, in the same way, my van work is it's very interesting small work. Um, I, I'm in fact I should have visuals, but it is uh, fitted with a periscope. Okay. The gold heart uh, returns to womb. Oh. Gold mm. heart because he he finds that uh, it is the world wi where I have come to is not a proper place. Right. So he returns to the womb mm. of his mother, mm. but he 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 fits a periscope to <laughs> see what is <laughs> happening out. It's a very small, inter okay, very dear to me, very yes. dear to me. Yes. Uh, and the periscope is done like a periscope, you know, a right. structural, okay. but uh, womb in terms of womb. And th those are, I mean, um, uh, physically whatever they may be. But conceptually, these are you know these are some works where I am dealing with uh, matters inside. Yes, yes. You know, yes. Uh, broadly, what we can yes. see matters inside. Yes. Whether they are inside our heart, inside yes. our mind, or so that is that is what my latest concern has been. Uh, you know, for example, trying to scan the mm, the. No reliquary and mm. trying to find what is inside it. So th these are uh, these are rather. Um, I mean, we see them as you know three-dimensional sculptures, but these are rather the matters um, matters from inside materialized, yes. transformed into the language into of material. And, and it's continuing. It's continuing. It's continuing, evolving it is continuing in a, in a number of ways. Yes. In a number of ways and in a number of shapes and sizes. It's continuing. Because ultimately you arrive at a stage where, where your uh, mm, matters become more, uh, more uh, you know, internal rather than external. external. You right. become more meditative, uh, so you you go more inwards rather than. Mm -hmm. you know. So that is how, I'm like of course the references or, you know, mm, the the things from which I take a cue. They are always, you know, around you. Yes. They are always around you. And I always believe that even uh, uh, while being a teacher, I have always been telling my students that we, sh we, we should uh, work hard and try and arrive at a place where we can transform anything into a sculpture. Right. That should be our growth. It's not that I have to, you know, walk 10 miles to find inspiration. Inspiration is there. It's, there. it's how, how you pick it up and how you transform it into your work, yes. yes. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you very you, thank much. You so it was much. wonderful talking thank to you. you. Thank you. And uh, best of luck for everything. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you very so much. much.